Hey there. Welcome back to Storytellers, where we go behind the book. I'm John Hartness. I'm the founder and publisher of Falstaff Books. And this is where I get to talk to my author friends and frequently the authors that we publish at Falstaff about the story behind the book, because I've always found that to be sometimes more interesting than what's on the page. So our guest today is a Falstaff author. Please welcome J.D. Blackrose. Hi, everyone. So tell the folks at home who you are and what you do. Sure. Um, so again, my name is J.D. Blackrose, and I write fantasy fiction, often with a lot of humor, uh, particularly some of the stuff that I've written very lately, most, you know, most recently for Falstaff. Um, I have three series that I've written for Falstaff, um, The Soul Wars, which is a four novella series, and uh, The Monster Hunter Mom series, which is in the Bubba world, in your Bubba world. Yep. And then the newest one is um, my zombie cosmetologist series, right? Which, right, exactly. Um, when I said it to you, you did exactly that. And I said, trust me, it'll work. Um, and yeah. <laughs> and it, so does. it does. Um, that's the, the first one is out as of now. Uh, and the second one will be out fairly soon. So. Now, we're going to focus mostly on the zombie cosmetologist because that's the new shiny. But mm -hmm. our associate publisher, Melissa MacArthur, describes the Soul Wars as true blood with Valkyries. Right, because the true blood, the only thing true blood was missing was Valkyries. So. It did have everything. It else. had everything it, else. Yeah. So now you've got Valkyrie. You've got Valkyries, you've got sex, you've got badass old ladies. You've got vampires. Right. We have it all. Yeah. So give us the elevator pitch on the Soul Wars. Yeah. So the Soul Wars actually uh, came from, uh, I, I, I was actually reading, this is a little more than the elevator pitch, but I was actually reading Faith Hunter's uh, Jane Yellow Rock series. Okay. And, um, you know, there's this main character this main um vampire and everything is always happening at this guy's mansion right like there's everyone's getting shoot up and the, the the mansion's constantly you know getting knocked down and they have to rebuild it and the police are coming out it's constantly happening and i just kept thinking what do the neighbors think like <laughs> what what the heck like what my god would you want to still live there Anywhere near? No, I know this is a mansion and there's a lot of land, but there have to be other people. And um, so suddenly this idea of this character who lives really cl like close-ish to this vampire came into my head. And her name is Adelaide, and the book actually starts with Adelaide. And it has nothing, nothing to do with Faith Hunter's world or anything like that. Right. But, but that's sort of it started with the question, what do the neighbors think? And that's, you know, where I started with, with that. Um, and it's basically it, the, the premise is that the world has vampires with souls and vampires without. And that's why when we read books about vampires, some vampires are good and some vampires are bad. And there's a war coming. And, um, Kara, the Valkyrie, lost a big bet, and she's been sent to Earth to uh, babysit this French vampire, and she hates vampires, and she hates being there, and she wants nothing to do with it, but she did lose a bet, and now she's on Earth babysitting this French vampire, and they have to work together to stop the oncoming soul war. Okay, cool. You know, it's funny, because the Black Knight Chronicles, one of my series, came from a similar kind of thought process. It came from me watching the first season of True Blood. Mm -hmm. And if you remember, there was one episode. I don't have you seen? Yeah, I've seen some of these. Okay. I mean I loved the book, so I actually didn't watch That's fair. the TV show because I loved the books. I just read the first book like a month ago. Yeah, I saw your um review of it. 
yeah, I, I had never read it before. Mm -hmm. And then when I watched the series, I wanted to make sure I gave it some distance. Yeah. Because, yeah. and I still couldn't, Vampire Bill will always be that actor. Now. Right. See, so, yeah, and I read all the books because I'm a huge Charlene Harris fan. And so I couldn't watch the TV series. It yeah. Me. Well, I was watching the show and there was a scene where Lafayette shows up and he's letting a, he's selling V, the drug that they distill from vampire blood, mm -hmm. to this overweight gay vampire. Or maybe he's draining this guy to make V, I forget. But there's this just pudgy, nebbishy vampire guy. And, I, and that's what sparked the Black Knight Chronicles was that same kind of what if idea. Why mm -hmm. aren't there more fat vampires? Right, like, shouldn't, do they just magically become handsome the second they become a vampire? Like, yeah. how does that happen? Because, you know, if you, if you go by Anne Rice's mythos, you're stuck in the body. Right. You know, your hair grows back to the same length if you cut your hair, even. Right. So that would be the worst thing in the world for a fat kid. Suddenly, right. you've got superpowers, unlimited cardio. And chronic acne. And chronic exactly. acne. And right. you're always going to look like a fat kid. Yeah. yeah. So that's where I find that my favorite stuff that I write comes from that kind of, it comes from a question, a what if kind right. of thing. Right. And it sounds like you do too. Yeah. So that, that's actually sort of where the soul, the soul wars happen, at, at least in terms of like one character. And then I, you know, I came up with this whole premise, but that, that's, that's sort of where that, that came up with. And, and it's the same with um, Monster Hunter Mom, right? Um, I emailed you and I said, I have this idea about a monster hunter, but she's going to be really different. And you were like, okay, you know. Yeah, I was like, all right, well. <laughs> all right, send me something. And so I came up with a Jewish monster hunter who has kids, right? And none yeah. of the other monster hunters have kids. And she has to work for the Holy Roman Catholic Church, which, you know, is a little weird. And I, you know, it just positioned yeah. her differently. I thought it was hilarious. I thought the premise was hilarious from the jump. And the reason I kept calling it for the longest time, I kept calling it Monster Hunter Soccer Mom. Right. Because Julie Kenner has a series, Demon Hunting Soccer Mom. Right, right, right. And it's like, no, Monster Hunter Mom, Demon Hunting Soccer Mom. But it's easy to see why you would do that because she's basically, she is basically that, right? She's, mm -hmm. she has to, Jess Friedman is the mom who still has to fight the wear gorilla and the Katsuni in the museum and still has to get snack to kindergarten on time or, you know, hold the birthday party in the backyard, you know, where the rule is you can have as many kids as the age of the child plus one. And <laughs> right, <laughs> like, that's the role. And it, I don't have I don't have any human children. That's so. the role we went with, and 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 of course it's got a lot of me in it, right? Because that's my life. I had three kids; they're older now, but you know I'm Jewish. I had three kids. I raised them in a suburban environment. I had a good kindergarten snack there on time. I usually was the mom wheeling in on like chew wheels. <laughs> you know, trying to get my kids from aftercare before they started charging me $5 a minute. I mean, like that, that was me. So it wasn't, e it wasn't hard to pick little scenes and vignettes from my real life to throw it in to make it feel real. And when moms read it, I, you know, I can see when they start laughing, it's almost like an in-joke because they're like, oh, right, done that, you know. Been There's there. a scene in one of the early ones that I I guarantee that's a real that's a real thing. Which I, one? She gets in her minivan and she takes a drink from a cup and a cup holder and realizes and it's apple juice. Yeah, yeah. And that it's been sitting there for like three days. Naturally, 
naturally. I mean, it's a, a sippy cup of apple juice. God knows how long that's been there. Yeah. Right. And that totally happened, right? Yeah, of course. I mean, all of those things in there happen. Absolutely every one of them. Um, in the, I think it's the third one. Yeah, in the third one, I actually worked my, my best friend Allison's name in. Um, she's one of the cops there. And um, I worked her dog, her dog, her almost dog, he's, he's gone now, but Loki in. Um, just for her, you know, I just sort of Ooh. snuck it in there and I sent it to her to read. And she was like, Oh, you work Loki in. But I mean, it's just, you know, it's just trying to snick, put these little things in there. But there is no mom that of oh, any children who has any children, whether they have one or they have three or they have five, who hasn't encountered those situations. And Every single one of them, when I when I talk to them, they're like, "Oh, the sweater set moms, yeah, I know." <laughs> the judgy bitches, the that judgy, are looking at the you judgy for green moms, Cheetos to snack. right? And I'm like, "Yeah, I know." Like, I finally one day I really got myself. I really figured it out really well, and I got I got grapes, and I went to the extra extra trouble of getting the green grapes and the red grapes, and I plucked them all off the stems and I mixed them up so it was a really pretty bowl and like wow I won that day like that was okay but like I remember that like that was a moment in my <laughs> in my mom life that I went to that to that extent so I know <laughs> and the the fun thing for me because I kind of I edit most of the bubble verse novellas right. because I created the overall universe right the fun and you thing. sometimes throw things at me like in their last one i now know that there's a monster hunter who comes to cleveland which i now have to work in to the next round of yeah thanks you're welcome <laughs> the the thing that i enjoy about jess particularly is that she is so different a lot of the hunters in the multiple series are big guys, tough, capable, well-armed. And Jess is running around a museum cafeteria kitchen looking for an egg. Right, exactly. I just need an egg. And, and then she finds out it didn't even have to be hard-boiled. Um, like, like, right? Like, she made a total fool of herself. Yeah. And, and, and she doesn't use guns, and she'll never use one. Right. Gail Martin's hunter, grenade launcher. Right, right. I think it's much harder to fight, um, you know, monsters of any ilk when you're willing to shoot them. Um, she's not willing to shoot them. She's not willing to have a gun. Now, she does have a slightly magical tomahawk. Um, I did have to give her something. Yeah. But, but that's it. And that, I find that to be so fascinating because I'll read Gail's Mark Wojcik books. I'll read um, Eric Asher's Mason Dixon books, my bubble books. They all have kind of, they all follow a similar, and here's Jess. <laughs> right, and Jess is doing it differently. <laughs> <laughs> Jess uses a jump rope, right? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> and Teresa Glover, also writes in the Bubba verse and her character Caitlin Kelly is also very different right but because Teresa's a horror nut her stuff is a lot darker right right and Caitlin if I'm remembering right is very young yes yeah she's, she's a pretty young good. character right she's also the only one of the hunters that's hot for her Catholic church liaison oh uh, yeah, I definitely did not build that in. My girl's a family, man, a family, you know, family, family yeah. girl. She's married. She's got three kids. She's loyal, and all she wants to do is protect them. And then, you know, that's the that's the crux of it, though, for Jess. If you want to get in, it's it's funny and yes, and it's lighthearted, yes. But there's you know there's a serious part too, which is she's got something at stake. She has a family that she has to protect. I think it's I think it's the third novella. 
which are collected in one volume called The Devil's Been Busy, available in hardcover, paperback, ebook, and audiobook from Falstaff Books. You can sure. go to falstaffbooks.com and pick that up. There's a link in the show notes. Um, <laughs> but I think it's the third one where she has to have a heart to heart with her husband because this stuff is impacting their life in ways yeah. that he wasn't prepared for. No, not at all. I mean, he knows what she is and she, he knew what she is when they got together, but no one ever expected some of the stuff that's rolling downhill on him now. And, um, and some of it has to do with her mom's past and it's putting their, you know, their family at risk, their kids at risk. And I think it's safe to say if you've read all of them that their youngest child is starting to show some really interesting things. Um, we're not so sure about what's going on with little Daniel. Um, but, He's different. And, um, and I, you know, I've been throwing those hints in there. So, and now, you know, if you're watching and you haven't watched it now, you know, to look for them, but, but that builds up through novella one through four. Yeah. And And the other interesting point is that she's the only hunter with a family. She is. She's the only one with a family. And that that creates a, yeah, it, it puts something at stake. Um, and that's just, again, that's me. That's just put me in there. That's just me, you know, putting yeah. a little bit of me in there and my life in there. Now to switch up to something that is completely not you, <laughs> very, very much <laughs> not you. Well, Please God, I hope. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about your new series, which started with Pluck and Cover. And this one, yeah. Yeah, zombie. he's a zombie cosmetologist. So, so there is a little bit. Okay, so let's just go back to Monster Hunter Mom. All of the titles of the novellas and then of the collection are songs, right? Right. So um, they're, they're all songs from the Traveling Wilburys, if anybody watching it's old enough to remember the traveling wilburys um, if anyone who's watching does not remember the traveling wilburys <laughs> expand your horizons people yeah please google them um they're they were a great super group so um that's that's what i did that was just a little thing for me and and for people who remember them i've only had one person uh come over to me at uh when i was at a table selling or signing or whatever I was doing who looked at them and went traveling Wilburys and I was so happy but um uh the thing with uh getting from there to zombie cosmetologist I did name my major character Waylon Jenkins which obviously sort of sounds a lot like Waylon Jones and a little bit and in each novella and there are four of them there's a little, there's a little piece of a lyric in every, every one to a Waylon Jennings song. So you can look for that. I found I, it. I found it did. in book one. You did. You found it in book one really fast too. And that was not actually all that obvious. Like I didn't think you, but you found it. Well, I'm, well, yeah, I was I, great. I, I was, like me some Waylon. <laughs> I, I was really impressed. A friend um, of mine used, was his lighting designer, his, lighting, oh, really? his tour lighting director for, he believes three years. He doesn't remember. Right, a lot of it. Uh, but there's a photo, there's a band photo in, back when there were albums. Right, there's well, a, the album cover work used to be a big deal. Yeah, well, when you would, uh, this was a double album and it had pictures of the band and crew. And he mm-hmm. says, yeah, I'm in the band picture in that album. <laughs> <sighs> I don't remember. Waylon was known for, he, yeah, a lot he of used. Things. Yeah, he used. So anyway, um, if you go and read, please look for the little hints. Actually, there's two. There's two in number two or three. I can't remember. But regardless. Um, so... I had this idea driving, which is when I do a lot of my thinking. I'm driving. And I had this idea originally for a zombie investigator who didn't get paid in money, but only got paid in new body parts. And 
I, I did. And I thought to myself how funny it was going to be because he insisted that they be fresh and that they couldn't kill anyone to get them, which was a right, exactly, major bummer. Um, hard. So I kept, I had this scene in my head that would play over and over again of all of these creatures popping out at all these murder scenes and the local medical examiner going, what? Like, what are you doing here? And he, she was have to fight them for the body. So I, I kept thinking of this zombie investigator. And then I said, zombie investigator, it's already been done. Like, and like, it's been done well by another author, Kevin J. Anderson. So I thought I can't do I can't do zombie investigator. Mr. Shambles already exists. So I, I was thinking of Monster Hunter Mom. And one of the reasons that I think it does well, and it was just what we were talking about, that there is a little bit of me in her, right? She's just a little bit. And I thought, well, what do I know? What else do I know? And actually, I, I know a lot, a lot about makeup. Like, an obscene amount of that about makeup because I watch makeup tutorials and I love that stuff. And there was really a period of time when I thought I was going to be a professional makeup artist. And then I decided to go into writing because it would be easier. <laughs> um, <laughs> and more profitable. <laughs> actually, being a professional makeup artist is really hard. Uh, and yeah. it's really, really hard. I barely passed that class in college. It, <laughs> it's actually just... Uh, whether you're doing it for theater, whether you're doing it for weddings, whether you're doing it for, you know, the catwalk, whatever, it's extremely hard to get into. And it's, you have to develop a whole kit. Anyway, it's a, it's a very hard profession, but it doesn't mean I don't like to know about it. So I was thinking about it and I was thinking makeup and then I said out loud in the car, zombie cosmetologist. And I just laughed. I burst out laughing. And I thought, well, if it makes me laugh, it might make other people laugh. And from there, I thought of this zombie who, saw, who gets dragged into solving murder mysteries, but um, he lives in, you know, basically in the LA area, and he's a cosmetologist to the stars. And that's, that's where that went. So... You know, that's Rick Galtieri's rule for comp writing comedy. If the third time he reads a line, it still makes him laugh. It stays in no matter what anybody else says. <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> that's so, Rick's yeah. rule. And then somehow the first line of the book, which I won't say. Uh, oh, yes, you will. <laughs> I want people to read it themselves. That first line is a hook. <laughs> so, okay. So... I really wanted to start with a strong hook. I, yeah. I wanted, I wanted, as you said, I wanted the first line to tell everybody everything they needed to know about this book, like yep. what, what this book was about. And they could read the very first line, very first paragraph, and they would either keep reading or they just or close done. it. And and right. Or close it. Right. 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 Exactly. And I kept thinking of, well, zombies are known for body parts um, falling off. And I kept thinking of, you know, all the museum statues. There are some key parts that always fall off. One key part. One. And noses. But noses aren't as funny. So, <laughs> so, so I just wrote the first line. I couldn't find my penis. And that and was it. Right there. You know where you're going to be with the book. Right. I couldn't find my penis. The last time I had seen it, it was on my nightstand next to my walk-in freezer. But when I emerged in the morning, it was gone. And there yeah. it is. That's the book. How do you not buy that book <laughs> after that? And uh, and then it goes on, and then you know you start meeting this crazy cast of characters, and including what the fuck, Mrs. Ross? Yeah. Well, somebody has to sew these things back on. But fair enough. <laughs> so if I'm going to have somebody sew them back on, why not be the best? 
she is one of the most famous seamstresses in American history. She was actually an upholsterer. I don't know if you knew that, but I didn't. She was, yeah, she was actually an upholsterer, but she was dra she made the flag. Yeah, at this point, everything I know about Betsy Ross is she made a flag and anything you've written. <laughs> okay, so well, I've made up pretty much everything, but she was That's technically fine. She's an upholsterer. Not no, she's not. I have been told by someone I, I learned online on Facebook, I heard from like a very long time distant relative of hers, somebody posted oh God. that she, um, I know, I was like, oh crap. Um, but I guess there's lots of people who, who do, you know, trace their lineage back to, you know, the founding fathers and the Mayflower yeah. and all that stuff. And someone posted and said she was really quite a character. And I said, phew, that's really oh, good. <laughs> that's really good. Yeah. I'm not typically one of those people that traces their family back, but I have relatives who are, and they found a land grant from King George deeding a piece of York County, South Carolina to some Hartness a million years ago. And I was like, huh. Huh, that's cool. So we really have we're really lazy we have not left right you haven't gone far <laughs> we got here almost 300 years ago and well this is where we're gonna stay yep. planted you planted seeds so yes. pluck and cover is the first book and it's available now yes. and what's the title of the second book oh it's my favorite hide and chic <laughs> so i love these titles and I can't wait to, for us to start figuring out what we're going to do for the cover of the collection. Yeah, the novellas yeah. are all kind of patterned after old crime novel kind of car, because Carl Hyacin's books feel right. like, they feel kind of like Hollywood crime books to me. Right. Yeah. And I mean, that's, the, that's the feel. Yeah. And I've spent, and <clears throat> inordinate amount of time coming up with these titles like way more time than you would think <laughs> is necessary but but lots of time so hide and chic is is i think really my my favorite but and it'll be coming out very soon yeah i don't have the release date in front of me because i i think it's june 11th ish sounds good yeah something sure. like that We'll make sure Melissa watches this. Yeah, that is actually exactly what we have now. June 11th. So yes, that'll be coming June 11th from Falstaff Books. <laughs> so what else is going on? Anthology stuff? Yeah. Um, so uh, I have a story in an anthology for, that's from, um, not, not Falstaff, but from Perspective Press. We don't that, do anthologies. Right. I know you don't do anthologies. Um, but it's a story called Poison by Sugar. And it's in, uh, what's the anthologies? Uh, Witches. Warriors and Wise Women. Yeah, Warriors and Wise Women. Thank you very much. It's lots of Ws. And um, I hope people pick that up and support that press too because they, they need it. Yeah. And it's, it's available good, now, I believe. Yes, it's available now. And I... I think people should pick it up. It's got a lot of really fun stories in it. Another Falstaff author, Darren Kenny's in it. He's got a great story in it um, called God Willing and the Creek Don't Rise. So I hope people will pick that up. And um, yeah, so I mean, a couple things like that. I've got a, a short story in submission that I'm like supposed to hear. I'm supposed to hear by the end of April. So mm. We're really close to the end of right April. Right up against it, aren't we? Yeah, right up against it. Um, so we'll see. Who knows? You know how that goes. We, we won't know. And um, I've got to I've got to finish uh, Zombie Cosmetologist number four for you. So working on that. Um, the third one has been sent to you guys for edits, and that one's going to be called Cut and Died. And then the last one with a Y, and the last one is going to be called Pose and Cons. Yeah, I told you I spent a lot of time thinking about these. Yep. And do you have, you don't tell them yet. Don't tell them. But do you have the collection name yet? 
I have an idea. Okay. We're not going to reveal that yet. No, no. But they're, they're, they're there. And I have some ideas for um, Monster Hunter Mom number five also. I, I, awesome. I find some thoughts for that. Yeah, I'm looking also. forward to that. Yeah, that would be good. And you also have a website where you do author interviews. I do. Uh, thank you. Great. <laughs> good for you. Um, I'm terrible at this. Um, yeah, so slipperywords.com. And that uh, there's a funny sort of like history to that. So I decided before I started writing for publication and should, people should know that I've been writing my whole life, but I didn't start trying to write for publication until like about only six years ago. So, you know, I was a, I was a grown up, a full grown up by then. So you started writing for publication six years ago. Correct. Your first book was published three years ago. Correct. So from start to book in hand was three years. Yeah. There's a whole lot of people watching this video who hate you now. Right. And I understand that. I really do understand that. And it sounds like that was super fast, but what it, and it was, it was, but I think what people need to know is that I have done public relations and media relations and, um, various forms of written spoken social communications for 25 plus years as a professional yeah. i've been writing my whole life and i've been writing fiction my whole life i just wasn't writing it professionally and trying to get it published and looking at it as a business so it's not as quick as it sounds i wrote my you, first you come you come at it in a similar vein as i did because i say i started writing fiction in 2009 but that's discounting the nine years of blogging and journalism and the five or 600,000 words of published writing that I had done right. before I started work on my first novel. Right. I mean, I know how to tell, I knew and know how to tell a story that that part I had been doing for forever. And I wrote my first short story when I was seven, but the, Writing in terms of creating a book that was ready for publication. Yeah, that Hi Puck. That didn't start until six years ago. Hi Puck. Oh, baby. Yeah, he's my buddy. Yeah. I knew if I didn't at least pay him some attention, he would sit behind me and meow really loudly. Oh. So now he's just gonna come up for 15 seconds, um, say, Hey, I'm not done with you yet. And then he's gonna jump down. <laughs> Right. So anyway, just to get back to the, the website, because you asked about it, slipperywords.com. Um, I knew that I wanted to start really seriously writing for publication. I knew I wanted to put a focus on it, not just as a writer, but as a business. And um, I knew I wasn't good enough to start publishing yet. So I put together a blog. And um, I came up with the idea of slippery words because that's sort of how I felt about them. They were just like very slippery and hard to pin down. Okay. And I kept thinking of that scene in Pretty Women where she gets with the escargot and then it flips out of her hands. And do you remember Pretty Women? Pretty Woman where Pretty Woman, yeah. Says, Pretty Woman where the escargot, the snail flips out of her hands and the, the waiter catches it. No, but I, okay, so, watched, I just okay. remember the scene where the people on Rodeo Drive were really bitchy to her, and then she... And she's and, like, and big she's mistake. Like, well, okay, so she's wearing the, the dress, the red dress, and he takes her to dinner, and she has no idea what to do with the snails. And she tries oh. to dig into one, and it literally shoots out of her bowl and flies out, and the waiter, like, catches it and, like, puts it behind his back really quick. And she just looks up... <laughs> And she goes, slippery little suckers. And that little scene kept <laughs> coming to my mind. And that's how I felt about words. So I called it slippery words. I later found out that um, there's a group of artists, including the artist that does the cover for Patricia Briggs's books, that got together. And they have a uh, website called Muddy Colors. <laughs> so we talked about the fact that it was sort of the same idea. But slippery words is mine. And... Uh, you can sign up for the e-newsletter there. Uh, you know, obviously you don't have to, but please do. You get access to a lot of free stuff. I give away a lot of stuff. And 
you sometimes get access to really cool author interviews because I have managed to wangle some some neat stuff that other people don't get access to right away. You get to it first, so you should sign up. There you go. All right, well, the cat has decided that we're done. So therefore. Therefore, we must be done. Thank you for spending a little time with us. Thanks and for having me. People can click on the links below to check out slipperywords.com. They can order your books in all of their different versions. And please, as always, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, and ring the damn bell, because Melissa will kick my ass if I don't tell people to ring the bell to get notified. So ring the fucking bell. <laughs> All right. Yeah, we appreciate it. Thanks so much. Thank you.